Hi everybody and welcome to the Soul Booth. It is my pleasure to introduce you to one fabulous woman. <laughs> this is my close friend Audrey Parker and she is all dressed in black today. How unusual. <laughs> which is really an aberration stylistically for you, aka not at all. <laughs> Live in black. But it's it's kind of appropriate for our conversation today mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because my first, my first question is do you know anyone who is more comfortable than you talking about death? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I'm working on it though. I have really changed the minds of a lot of people. I talk about it. I was diagnosed with cancer and I've been talking about my death ever since. Mm -hmm. so so, that's it. So it's not just death that she's comfortable talking about. Audrey is supremely comfortable talking about her own death mm -hmm. and you've been so open um, in embracing Absolutely. the process that you, as you say, you have changed a lot of minds. Well, when I was first diagnosed a year and a half ago, I was diagnosed, as you know, at stage four breast cancer. I've since learned that my, my skeleton is, uh, my surgeon said it was, uh, my skeleton was one of the top three most cancer-ridden skeletons he's ever seen in nine years. Was she, she saw that as sort of a win, like, I remember I came in. Uh, you kept saying, I want to be day. first. I want to be number one. <laughs> I came into that hospital room and you had just talked to me and said, Nance, guess what? And it was like, go big or stay home. That's right. And then I just had hip surgery because a tumor took out my right hip. So I said to him when he came to see me, I said, now that big tumor that took out my hip bone, um, and he very, uh, fabulously fixed my hip and it was a 50 50 chance that it would shatter when he started drilling the bone mm -hmm. so it was a pretty scary thing for me i didn't know whether i would walk or not when i woke up from the surgery but um he i said to him that big tumor that took out my hip do i have any other ones that i should be sort of concerned about he said audrey you're bloody full of them so it was a really good it was a really good thing to talk with him and have someone be honest with me so that I know exactly what I'm dealing with. It doesn't scare me for some reason. I have no fear of death. Uh, you know, I almost drowned as a child. I had encephalitis as a child. So I've lived most of my life not really being afraid of death for some reason. Mm -hmm. And then once I had to come face to face with it, I knew at the moment that I was diagnosed, actually when they first put it on my radar is when I sort of made peace with it, but I knew I had three choices. Feel sorry for myself, chase a cure, which I'd never find because I'm too far gone, or just lean in as we say and just embrace it and make the very best of the rest of my life. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I will never forget the words you said to me the morning of your diagnosis, and you were going to you were going to learn that afternoon um, whether you had cancer or not. You knew they thought it was probably cancer from having looked at your spine. Right? That's right. They took a, a chest X-ray and saw that my bones didn't look great, and said to me, "There's something we're not liking the look of your bones." And I'm like, "What do you mean?" Mm -hmm. But anyway, so we they just had to keep investigating just to make a hundred percent diagnosis. But I still get goosebumps or truth bumps, as I like to say, mm -hmm. when I think about your phrasing of it that morning because you said, Nancy, I've thought about it and no matter what they tell me this afternoon, I'm going to live my life the same way. If they Absolutely. tell me I've got two months to live, I'm going to live joyfully. I'm not going to waste any time crying. And if they tell me I don't have cancer, I'm going to live joyfully for the rest of my life. Absolutely. And a lot of people you know, might be able to get those words out, but not a lot of people would be able to follow through. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I am following through because of friends like you, I have the most spectacular support system, as you know. And I don't know that my experience would be quite so fabulous if I didn't have the support system that I have. But there's really nothing you can do about it. And the other thing that played a lot uh, towards my attitude was that we spend so much time borrowing trouble. As our friend uh, Maggie McGee's mom, Doozy, used to say, don't borrow trouble. And I, that always sticks in my mind. Why get upset about something you have absolutely 
no control over. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I have found a way to take control of my situation where I have absolutely no control. I control my attitude. I control those that are in my life. I control, I have my celebration of life all planned, as you know. Mm -hmm. I have my affairs in order. Um, I feel like I'm in control, even though I'm not. And it's such a good feeling to to really um, model your life after what you wanted it always to be. And I want to be kind, helpful to others, um, and just be kind to my fellow man and lead by example. I have young grandchildren and I'm leading by example. I want to teach them how to leave the world gracefully. And I don't think that our last breath is any less important than our first breath. And that is my motto, big time. Uh, no one has ever said to me, your first breath is so much more important than your last. So I am going to make sure that my last breath is the best that it can possibly be. I love the way you put that because it really brings to mind the way we celebrate a birth. Mm -hmm. You know, birth is all about celebration and people are joyful and yes. their presence and, and lots of love, of course. Mm -hmm. But in our society, we treat death. Death is literally shrouded in black. You I know, know. And in stigma. I know. So Such a shame because we as, our, as a society and in our culture, we're so afraid of death. So therefore, we don't give the elderly or the dying the support that they really should have a lot of the time because we're just so afraid of it ourselves. And to me, when I take that last breath, I can't wait to see what happens, to be honest. If I go to another realm or if, I, if that's it or if there's heaven or hell, I can't wait to see what happens, really. And I'm such a curious person, so that's, that's sort of playing a little bit on my mind. But I really... I really feel that my last breath is extremely significant of my life, and I consider that my life has been well lived. I've traveled around the world. I've known fabulous people. I've worked with the poor. I've worked with big celebrities. I've, you know, just had a really interesting life. And okay, let's just let's just pause on the grander <laughs> scheme there and give them an example, okay? Okay. Uh, I described Audrey to Megan and Marie, who of course are behind the cameras as always. Yes, and we love them. A few minutes ago, I described her as the queen of self-reinvention. Mm -hmm. um, just as quickly as you can, for for the effect's sake, yes. uh, go through all the different <laughs> jobs or many of the different jobs you've had. Oh, my God. I don't even know if I can remember. On your market set, go. Okay. I didn't finish high school, but since then, I have a Bachelor of Arts in English. I have an advanced diploma in public relations. I have a diploma from St. Avex in adult education. And I did two years of commerce at SMU, but I got a job and didn't finish. I've been a... Uh, I've sold every kind of high-end clothing to men and women. I have been a fashion buyer. I have been the general manager of Mills Brothers. I worked for CBC as a makeup artist and stylist. I used to have my own business teaching ballroom and Latin dancing. Um, in fact, you taught most people in the a, city. A half a city, dance. I've taught them to dance for their weddings and such, uh, you know, many, many years ago now. Um, I do eyelash extensions. I do beauty things for people, makeup, and um, I'm licensed as a hairstylist, a lash technician, and a, ma a makeup artist. Wardrobe and consultant. A, and I'm a wardrobe consultant. I've worked as an image consultant with lots of celebrities, lots of um, businesses in town, you know, that uh, uh, had people that they wanted to rebrand and what have you. So I've worked with a lot of people doing that over the years. <laughs> it's been it's been it's been a ride I have to say well I think that you're oh and fundraising excuse me yeah. I've done a ton of fundraising for bre for breast cancer and I now am a breast cancer patient mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, sorry well all I was gonna say is that I think you, you know you mentioned working with celebrities one of the things I always tell people about you if I'm introducing them mm -hmm. to you is that you have um, a sense of comfort in your own skin, unlike most people I know. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a magnetism because you are willing to talk about anything 
with anybody. Absolutely. Norma Lee McLeod that I used to work with at CBC wrote me a, a reference letter once and she said, Audrey could talk to the Queen of England. No problem. No problem. Yeah. And I don't know, I think it's funny, you know, because I grew up very underprivileged and, and all of that. But for some reason, um, throughout my life, and I start, I moved out on my own when I was quite young. And, and for some reason, I just gained confidence through doing by so many different experiences in my life. And I would get myself in situations like for work and whatever. And I think, oh, my gosh, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> but I'm really good at problem solving and, and puzzle uh, solving. So I was always able to see the forest for the trees, the big picture, and then sort of zero in on the smaller things mm -hmm. that needed to be taken care of. And I think when I'm dealing with people, I've learned I was Miss Halifax back in 1982, mm -hmm. and one of the judges said to me, you are you won this competition because of your personality, mm -hmm. more than anything else. And I learned at a really young age, I was in my early 20s, to just be myself, and that would serve me well. So when I work with celebrities, it's really interesting. I've watched some of them just wash the floor with people interviewing them and stuff, and I'm the bloody makeup artist, and they are so good with me. Mm -hmm. Somehow I'm able to treat them with the respect that they're used to being treated with, but I'm almost like a friend with them. When Lionel Richie was in town for the, da the David Foster mm -hmm. Gala, and I was hired to be their handler, like for all the celebrities while they were in town. And I, and I said to Lionel, I said, look, I have a party for you to go to. I have a car waiting to take you to a bar if you want to go to one. He said, Audrey, I would just like you to have dinner with me. Mm -hmm. And he was with his manager, uh, Michael. And we just had a very down-to-earth dinner. We talked about being grandparents. Mm -hmm. We talked about life. Um, he gave me some great compliments, sort of saying that, you know, uh, he's met a few people in his life that he knew that would be able to, you know, be the life of a party. If he had a party, he could invite these people and he could go to bed and they would take over the party for him. You're he said, and he, and he said, you would be, he said, Audrey, you would be one of those people. Mm -hmm. I took it as a compliment, but. I immediately think he wanted to have dinner with you because he knew that you wanted to have dinner with Lionel Richie, the human, oh, yeah, not the, all, Lionel Richie, the celebrity. Not the celebrity at all. Yeah. And he was very, and, and they were all very real with me. I was ironing, you know, William Joseph shirts, like on the, uh, you know, before he went out on stage. And, and David said to me, David Foster said, Audrey, could you get someone to steam my clothes? And I said, David, it will be faster for me just to iron them myself. So, you know, I'm one of those people, um, and that's why people hire me to do, or have in the past, I, I can't really work these days, but hired me in the past to do things because I'm a jump in and get things done. I have one speed and it's called go. And uh, that's the hardest thing in having cancer mm -hmm. is that my stamina is so poor. As you know, I can't dance anymore. I can't even walk very far. I get so tired. And, uh, you know, even just coming through my hip surgery, I've, you know, I, I just could not let myself sit around and feel sorry for myself. I had to get up and get that hip moving and it's moving really well now. So. But it seems to me that the reason that you are comfortable with anyone, as mm -hmm. the, you know, as you said, even the queen would yes, be a, would a reason for you to be intimidated, <laughs> and I love that, is because you just see people as being equal. Absolutely, we're all equal. And you see them without the. Uh, maybe the layers or the masks. Mm -hmm. I get right to the soul of someone very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's the, my greatest gift. I think it's uh, it's something that has really served me well. I can zero in. I can meet someone, and I share of I share with them something you know that something from me and it sort of breaks down the barriers and then they're able to share with me mm -hmm. it's i find it such a gift they feel your vulnerability yes yes they they are able to be real with me and i've heard for years and years and years everyone says audrey we love you because you're so real mm -hmm. and i never really understood what that meant but now going through this experience and looking and i'm so it's funny when you are you know, when you have a terminal illness, you go through a lot of phases. And I never really realized that, but I've been writing and I'm in a phase now. I look, I didn't cry once after they put, you know, cancer on my radar. 
before it was even properly diagnosed. I have not cried once about having uh, terminal cancer since then. But I learned from a new um, oncologist that I got recently that I've probably had this cancer in my body, you know, 12 to 15 years. It has invaded every square inch of my skeleton, but it has not touched an organ, which is so highly unusual. So she said to me, you're probably going to live for a couple more years. And I have been crying <laughs> ever since. I can't believe it. You know, I've been you so emotional. emotional. I have been so emotional because I thought, look, I'm, I'm probably going to see my granddaughters graduate now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be around with my friends more. I have lots of things to plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just gave me a whole new lease on life, which is kind of interesting. But I'm very much in a phase now of being grateful. And I want to help others. So, you know, anytime I can do something to help someone, because my other friends are helping me daily, I just really want to give back as much as I can. So that's where I am right now. Okay, so let's talk about end of life then yes because i know that's a, a major focus for you right Absolutely. now personally and and professionally or out in the world um and i'm going to take us to a, a possibly an emotional place i'm, I'm going to really try, try not to cry hold it together for you <laughs> because we just um audrey and i uh lost a mutual friend last week and um, had the funeral just a few days ago at the time of this taping. And I had to stand up and uh, give a eulogy for the first time in my life, which was Did a really, great job. It was really my least favorite job ever, although the one for which I felt most honored. And I, yes. knew, you know, I knew that I would be supported. He was an unbelievable guy who found out eight months ago that he had an inoperable brain tumor and he he had you as an example i have to say you know he already could see how you were handling your yes. prognosis and he had come out to several little uh, events that were in my honor he came out to support me and then i ended up outliving him which just kills yeah. me i have to tell you i know you were much more emotional about his oh journey i said i would have I you know what i would have traded positions with him in a heartbeat because i've already i have done absolutely everything i wanted to do i am ready to go tonight if i have to go tonight i am ready um and he has a, a daughter who's in New York studying acting and what have you. So I would have traded places with him in a heartbeat. So he could have been, he could have lived longer to see all that. But that's not how life works. Yeah. So all we could do was be very supportive of Ken and of, of he and his wife and family. But, you know, he really did decide very early on. Yes, This I is noticed. what we're going to do. We're mm -hmm. going to deal with it with, with um, humor and we're going to be positivity. open with our friends with positivity. Yes. We're going to share the journey. Yes. And their friends came together. Uh, an extraordinary number of people oh, came together and supported them in such a way that my observation of it was that it's almost like a painkiller because it the love. Oh. It's, you know, extreme amount of love and support they experienced. Yes. And the gratitude for it mm -hmm. um, filled them up so much that they didn't have as much time and and ability to focus on the pain of what he was going through. Absolutely. Do you feel the same way? I feel the same way. I am, if I'm really honest, I have two stepdaughters, six grandchildren. I'm unmarried. I'm divorced. I, I left my husband actually only months before I was diagnosed. We're still very good friends. We're still very close, but we're better friends, I think, than we were partners. Um, so really, if I'm honest, I have very little uh, family. I'm really quite alone in the world, but I do not feel alone. I have friends the minute I'm in pain or I need to go to the hospital. You're usually one that, that's taking me often. But, you know, I have three primary caregivers. You're one of them. And then I have a huge, vast array of other friends that are always saying, what can I do to help? And I know that you guys were getting a little tired, so I have been reaching out, and a lot of other friends are stepping up and helping. So, And you give them a gift. So, and, and you give I, us all a gift by allowing us to help. And right? I learned that through our friends passing and how... Uh, the people that he worked with and that I used to work with stepped up in such a huge way. It was, you can't even like get your head around it. Profound. Profound. And um, so by, 
by reaching out to others. See, I am astounded when I hear of people who have cancer or are dying and they don't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. I'm astounded by that because I want to give the gift of sharing even in my end of journey to those around me. And I want it, I want to be a little bit selfish and make it as good for myself as I can be. So by surrounding myself with fabulous friends that I have, it's taken me a lifetime to find all of you. And it's my greatest accomplishment in life is my friendships. I don't want to make you cry. But I will segue into the fact that I have all of these things taken care of. But I am adamant that my end of life experience be the way I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And I had a shock when I went into the hospital months ago to visit a dying friend. And when I saw him in a hospital setting, I was like, whoa, I am so not dying in the hospital. Mm -hmm. I don't care if I have to die on the side of the street. Nothing against the hospital. I think hospitals are spectacular, but they're more like a garage for people. <laughs> they're not a place to go and die. That I, that's how I feel about it. And I want to be in a home-like environment with my loved ones. I want to hear beautiful music. I want to be in a cozy bed. I want my cat there. I want my family and close friends there. So for me, I learned about a hospice, what a hospice was, and I was all over it. Mm -hmm. So we are now uh, Halifax or Nova Scotia and Newfoundland are the only two provinces in Canada that don't have a hospice. And I am not dying until we get one. You heard it here. That's it. I'm not dying. <laughs> I, I, I will be absolutely. freeze dried, but I am going to that hospice to die if it, if it kills me. I do not doubt <laughs> one syllable of that statement. I'm I you. am. So they've broken ground mm -hmm. and I'm trying to help them raise a little bit of money. The CEO, Wendy Frazier, says, Audrey, you are the poster child of what a hospice is all about, because I am so adamant about my end of life experience being wonderful. And that's what a hospice is all about. Mm -hmm. They try to make the end of life experience the best it can be. Okay, so um, what do you want to do with that? Our friend, <laughs> our friend Ken, who just died, um, was able to Die pass at away home. at home. And he expressed his gratitude to his wife, mm -hmm. our very good friend, uh, the day before, I think, and said, you know, how grateful he was that he was there in his own surroundings with soft music and, and low lights. Yes. And, and um, he literally died wrapped in love. His you know? daughter and wife were holding him as he passed away. And I just can't think of anything better than that. I'm not going to cry. I can't think of anything better than that. That's exactly um, how we should all be able to go, if that's what we choose. Yeah. And, you know, in a hospice environment, it's free. So there's no, like, major financial things to deal with that family has to deal with. And if you can't die at home, then that is the second best place. And uh, I just love talking about end of life because I want us all to feel more comfortable with it and to and to understand what a hospice is. We actually need three in our city. We need 30 beds a day in, in where we live for the dying. And the hospice only has 10 beds because if they make them larger, they become institutionalized. Mm -hmm. So they try to keep them just down to 10 beautiful suites. And they have doors that open up to a garden. They have music. They have uh, kitchens and kitchenettes. They have pull out beds in every suite mm -hmm. so that family can stay with you. It's just such a civilized way to pass away in our society. And uh, I really want to try to promote people looking into it and thinking about it and, and uh, helping to finance and even just donating a few dollars here and there if a lot of people do it it really makes a difference mm -hmm. over time we'll put a we'll put a link yes. in the description to this video um so that if people want to make a donation i would to really the appreciate it you're yes. working on that's that right great. that's right um one when when ken died he said his his last words were this was exactly what i wanted yes and i'm so happy for him and, and, and his family that's and that's you know what you're talking about um, I have my own theory that maybe he was talking about his whole life because he had a beautiful life. He did. He was a great guy. Apart a really from great man. His death, 
his terrible, untimely death, um, he had a perfect life. I never saw him raise his voice once. No. I've never seen him upset. He's cool as a cucumber. Fabulous father, fabulous husband. He and his wife are married 30 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, really, really top-notch guy. And I'm so sad that we lost him this early. But he is a great example in this because he went from zero to a hundred I know. you know in March when he was diagnosed he would not have said no he, he was healthy he was so, yeah but also I don't think he would have been anywhere near that uh comfortable with the concept of dying and and how to do it and so on and mm -hmm. he was just he just you know um he leaned decided, in and he just leaned in, as you say mm -hmm. so um it's really about changing attitudes yes and I know you said at the beginning of our of our conversation you're trying to change attitudes yes why is it that we we all I, we, you know we grew up this way I suppose mm -hmm. with, with the secrecy around death and the hushed tones and so on mm -hmm. um, but we all are gonna are gonna do it <laughs> uh, look I just have it's on my radar because I happen to be diagnosed but I've already had three people I know Four, actually two people died just yesterday. So five people. I've outlived five people that I know. And so since I, you were diagnosed. Since I was mean, diagnosed, yeah. yes. So, you know, by getting by ever and I say to young people too, like get around and write down what you want. Because no one really knows or think about it. I found that when I got all my affairs in order, like my my will and and who was going to have what and whatever, um, and got everything taken care of. It gave me such a sense of peace, knowing that if anything ever happened to me, that everything was taken care of. And I highly recommend people of all ages, you know, do the ex do the exact same thing. I really do. It kind of changes the peace in your life. And and you mentioned about um, attitude, and I would say that, and you're around me all the time, and I think you'll agree that I am positive every single day. I, kind of scary, it is. It kind of scares me, to be honest, but I think it's my best medicine, to be honest. I don't think I'd be here if I was being really negative. Um, and I would say to our viewers, you have a 50-50 chance every time you make a decision. You can choose to borrow trouble and say, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening, and poor me, and woe is me. Or you can just wait and see if it even happens. 99% of the time, the bad thing doesn't even happen. But we get stressed about it, our hair falls out, we can't sleep, we're sick, we can't eat, and the, th the bad thing doesn't even happen. So I'm more about waiting to see what happens. But for this moment, today, we, you know, we read books about, like from Eckhart Tolle about living in the now, and I have to tell you, I am really living in the now. I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow. I have no idea what is on my books for tomorrow. Has I am that been here. a gift of this? Has that been a gift in this situation, do you think? I think I think I've always had a little touch of that, but this has really brought it home for me. I live for this moment. So I'm here with you and the girls and I'm making the best of this moment. I'm enjoying myself. I'm comfortable. And then when I leave here, I'll go do whatever it is I'm doing tonight, you know? Like I really try to live in the moment and be grateful that I'm with who I'm with. And um, when I'm out and about, you know, I'm fairly well known in the city. I did a, an interview recently on CBC and that's how they introduced me. They said, Audrey is fairly well known around the city. Well, I've taught dancing. I've done a lot of different jobs and I'm a friendly, outgoing person. And I just know a lot of different people. That's sort of my claim to fame is I, is I know a lot of people. And like I say, it's my greatest accomplishment in my life, all the friendships I've developed. So what's really cool now, and talking about living in the now, and talking about end of life, is I am bringing together so many different girlfriends, as you know, like from different walks of life. And at my celebration of life, you'll all have each other. You know, like a lot of you are newer friends because you maybe heard about this person but didn't hadn't met them yet. And now um, a lot of different friends are coming together and when they see each other, they're giving big hugs and kisses. And that just 
does so many good things for my heart. It makes me feel really good. You're the glue. I'm the glue. I'm being the glue. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think a lot of people watching might marvel at how comfortable you are with the concept of your own death. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about faith. I, or belief. Okay. What should I say? I think belief. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the Baptist church as a child. I converted to Catholicism when I got married. And I love going to church. I love going to St. Mary's Basilica when there's no service. <laughs> and just go in there and be quiet and pray and think. Oh, you just know? when you're alone? Oh, I like it best when I'm alone. And... I have made such peace with my death that I don't need religion to send me off. I'm of the mind, um, I kind of believe that we live a predestined life because I should have died like uh, several years ago. Like I keep almost dying and then I don't. And I keep thinking, why am I still here? And I just haven't done what I'm meant to do yet. And I think what I'm, I think talking about end of life and stuff like that is what I'm meant to do. I just have that feeling um, or to inspire others somehow, even if I inspire a few people and they inspire others and so on and so on, then I feel like I've done my job. But I believe that we live a predestined life that we probably go to another dimension of sorts. We were fortunate enough to have dinner with Anita Morjani, mm -hmm. who uh, wrote the book Dying to Be Me, and I loved her. I loved her messaging. And she um, was full of cancer and died and sort of went to the other side but came back, and that was her experience. She had... She said that she went to another dimension, but it wasn't earthly, so it's really hard to discuss it in earthly terms because... We just can't get our head around. She said, like, you could see 360 degrees, but you had no eyes. She came back and told the doctors about conversations that were... Ha that were what they were having while she was, yeah. like, deceased that, or, and, and or so sick that she... In other rooms. Yes. So things and on the airplane, on, on the airplane, rooms. that are, when her brother was on the airplane yeah. talking to someone, right. she mentioned that she heard that conversation. She told him verbatim what he had said. So... And I, she came back, just in case you haven't read the book. And, yes. And she, we highly re recommend she, it. She came back into her body on the table and and the cancer was gone um, like within a month the cancer that's right completely yeah. disappeared yeah. and and she uses uh, i think she uses, has scans and x-rays in her oh yeah she has book yes and, and um has certainly shown them a lot because mm -hmm. she she has to convince a lot of people who are naysayers absolutely say, Come on. yes but you know but we saw so all that stuff so happen. so i kind of like what she has to say and when i was a young when i was young i i remember hearing about plato's theory of the soul and i kind of attached myself to that theory i, pro I probably didn't really grasp it properly but the idea that we are energy and a soul and we, our soul lives on and I have seen you know I, I've lost some loved ones over the years and when they pass away there's just a body there's no soul there's nothing left so where does our soul go so I'm going to Do you to, find it comforting this is a strange question perhaps, I love it but I love do it you find it comforting to see someone's dead body when it's someone you've loved it's it to me they're completely gone it's like like looking at that sofa it's so clear yeah it's so clear that they're gone I, I really was uncomfortable with the concept of open caskets when i was a kid and i found out about it so and i bet you were drugged to a few ever do that? but yes. but really at, at my age now it actually inspires me with hope because i see that it's so clearly a vessel or a vehicle you know, for our the, life on earth, right? Using. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I totally agree with you. And that's how I feel. I'm being cremated. Um, I always say this when I'm talking to people like I when I was, you know, trying to get all my affairs in order, I started uh, shopping around for cremation. And the first place I went to was $6,500 for, for to be cremated. And I, I almost left them a check. And then I went home. I thought, no, I'm going to sleep on it. And then my friend told me about this man who does, who used to work for a lot of these um, funeral homes. And he and I met, and he's going to do my cremation for like $1,000. <laughs> 
was it was so fun to talk with them and negotiate because they're not used to negotiating with life people. So it was really cool. I really loved him. And I said, you know, I will promote your business. And I did. And several other people, you know, signed up for uh, getting their cremation done. If you sign up now and pay for it, that's the price you pay when the actual day comes years and years from now. So if you want to save some money on your funeral plans, <laughs> like, <laughs> now is the time now. And I love to shop. Anyone that knows me knows how much I love to shop, even for my funeral. So. I thought you were going to say, if you sign up now, <laughs> yeah, and we got a deal for you. But if if you're interested, you can contact Audrey that's through right. me. Um, yeah, I think that's really um, so much of why you're comfortable. Mm-hmm. That I'm going, sister. I'm going, no matter wh- uh, whether I want to or not. So just by making peace with it, making a little bit of fun about it, um, why not? Why not? When I go, I will be so ready to go because I have a skeleton full of cancer and it's very, very painful. So you're you're seeing me tonight pain free, and I have been in terrific pain the last three, well the last yeah. I would say two three months been bad. Oh, it's hard You've to, seen me through a lot and of you it. Have, you have the highest pain threshold of anyone I've ever met. Easy yes. hands down. Um, okay, so do you want to talk about this? Is a perfect ultimate example of how you are finding fun and joy in this journey. Yes. Um, tell them where your ashes are going to be kept. <laughs> well, initially, I I have a Chanel tattoo. I love designer things. I worked in fashion for a lot of my career. And I decided that I wanted to do something a little bit different. So I wanted my I wanted to have a little bit of a Chanel theme. So um, I'm ha- I'm not having a regular funeral. We're having celebration of life at a hotel, and my urn is a vintage Chanel handbag that I bought in Paris last year. And I really neg- I told I walked into the store. That's right. Tell them about the conversation. <laughs> I walked in. I was with my friend uh, um, Melody Langlois, and she uh, organized finding the vintage store. She had met me in Paris, uh, and we had a lovely time together. And I walked in as big as life and said to the owner, I'm here looking for a vintage Chanel handbag to use for an urn at my funeral. <laughs> she didn't bat an eyelash. She just went with it. And she, we started looking around. And I just couldn't find anything. And I said, OK, I'm just going to have to give up. And uh, then Melody said, oh, my gosh, what about that one? And it was perfect. But it was going to be about $3,000 uh, Canadian <laughs> because of the uh, euro and everything. And I said to her, I just can't bring myself to spend that kind of money for something that I'm going to use for my funeral, you know, or for my uh, celebration of life. You know, you know me, I've never spent more uh, than 150 You're going to get one of mine. In my life. <laughs> she is definitely in she's definitely going to inherit a designer bag from Audrey. But when you told me this story originally, you said and I got her down by She took off $1,000. <laughs> and and when you said that I was like she took off $1,000. <laughs> How much was this purse? <laughs> so, but the other lovely thing I had found found a ceramic uh, replica of a Chanel handbag that you use as an urn and it was going to be 1400 Canadian and I wanted it I wanted that sort of like a big part of the look of my, of my celebration of life. Style. I know the style of it, right? And I think everyone would expect me to do something like that as well. So anyway, I came home and my very dear friend Joanne Ball had organized this beautiful afternoon in her pool and hot tub for me to go over right after I got back from Paris. And when I got there, um, four other friends were there and Joanne's husband and they brought in a chef and they cooked for us all day they waited on us hand and foot the the guys did and they had a card for me at you know that when we were having dinner and I opened it and there was eight hundred dollars in it so friends had stuffed in a bunch of money to go towards the urn so I ended up paying less in the end than I did uh, for the actual urn that I almost bought and I said to the girls when I'm gone because my ashes will be in plastic and I'm hoping um, to have them scattered uh, I have a little plan for where they're going to be scattered and I said you girls whoever chipped in for the bag they can have the tra- <laughs> what was that movie they'll have the uh, traveling uh, traveling, pants. <laughs> the traveling handbag travel, travel the traveling person. Chanel handbag right they can all have it for a month a year 
this will completely freak out some people hearing you say that and I even catch myself at times uh, our friend Kim and I have talked about this because we talk about it so easily with you mm -hmm. and sometimes we'll be talking to someone else and say oh well yes our, our you know my friend Audrey has uh, um, terminal cancer and da 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 and and they're like whoa 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 slow down <laughs> what and how are you saying this so casually and I think it can almost come off as being flippant um, or something yeah that's right and that we don't care but uh, you know how much we care I know and we take our cues from you mm -hmm. and it's a great example of how you shift the conversation because you have shifted Holy cow. You Kim couldn't even cry. Kim cried every single moment that I was around her when I was first uh, diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And now she can talk about that. We laugh about the celebration of life. Well, when we had the, I have, what is it, like eight people? I have a committee of the best party planners, event planners in Halifax have all come forward to say that they wanted to organize my celebration of life for me. And uh, Nancy's my MC. And, you know, I've got people organizing the party, the after party at my friend's house for my family and close friends, and whatever. And we laughed so hard. <laughs> when we were at my apartment talking about it that I got a complaint and we were laughing about my funeral. <laughs> but it's just, and I don't mean to come off, you know, too um, laissez-faire about it, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Once that cancer starts going into my organs, then I'm going to be checking out. And I can assure you, by the time that day comes, I will be very ready. I'll be in a lot of pain. I'll be ready to go. And because everything is taken care of, every day now is a new experience for me. Every day is an experience. And I am sucking in all those experiences. I've been meeting new people lately. I've been going to tons of events. I've had friends, you know, friends are always buying me tickets to events and making sure that I'm out and about. I mean, I feel like a princess. Mm -hmm. I feel like a princess. I'm the princess of Halifax <laughs> right now. And yes, I'm, you know, moving towards death, but I'm going to keep fighting. I'm, I have a little bit of a new lease on life. I'm going to keep fighting, you know. You know, the one other thing I think about when, when you use the word flippant, for instance, some people might think we were being flippant. Um, you are talking about death in a very positive way, uh, you're embracing it. That doesn't mean in any way that you deny the importance of, the no. existence of grief and loss. And we both have felt this, uh, you know. This past week, I grieved for Ken. And I cried a lot, I'll tell you. I cried a lot. I tried to I tried to even write his wife, and I, I couldn't because I just couldn't stop crying. And I, I, the, the part about me dying, I'm going to be gone. But the part that kills me is making everyone sad. That's the part that's going to kill me. So... Yes, I'm very casual about it, but knowing that I'm going to make you cry and my other friends cry and my family and make everyone sad, that part leaves me a little bit cold, I'll be honest. But, That's a but, way to put it. <laughs> but, a, but, but as far as my experience and my, and what I, and I, when you're, when you're on this journey, you have to be a little tiny bit selfish. You have to kind of think about what you want, what you can do for those around you. Um, my friends are always doing for me, so I'm always trying to do little things for them just because it's tit for tat. Like, it makes me feel like I'm still an active member of society. It still makes me feel like um, I'm being, I'm putting my best self forward. And that's what I want right now. How do you want to be remembered? I think I want to be remembered as uh, a kind soul as someone who came to this earth and tried my best to be a good citizen. Um, I don't really have a lot of regrets, I have to honestly say. I, I've never, I can't think of one situation other than when I was like a bratty kid or something that I was unkind to another human. So I take pride in that. I guess I kind of want to re be remembered for things like that. The other joy in my life at the moment is I'm making friends with all of the children of my friends, mm. like your children, uh, uh, several of my girlfriends, I'm really close with their children now. And I really want their children to remember me as being kind of cool and fun loving oh, and will. not afraid of 
deaf, you know, things like that. Yes. I have no doubt they will. And and it, I have to tell the audience that um, I have said that you're very direct, that you can talk about anything with anyone. And now that you've brought up being friends with your friend's children, it made me think about the day last summer when you said to my 10-year-old daughter and her friends, you know, girls, when you grow breasts, you've got to get them checked and you have to pay attention and you just should start, as soon as they start to grow, you should make sure you're comfortable checking your breast. And if you ever want to feel what a uh, cancerous a tumor feels like, my, my tumor is still like there yes. in a breast, I, you know, I would be happy to allow you to feel mine. I would be totally comfortable with that. And that took my breath away because I thought it's just another great example of how you just say it. You know, a lot of other people would never even think about broaching that conversation. I'm so weird. And you're just out there, baby. You're just I don't mean to be. It's just who I am. No, I am it's beautiful. 100% myself all the time. Yeah. Give me knuckles. Thanks for doing this. Thanks. You're welcome. Is there anything we haven't talked about that no. you wanted to? Nothing that we can say here. Well, boy, it's, too, it's too incriminating. All the rest of it's too incriminating. But I thank, I thank everyone for listening. And if I can inspire someone, and I know those people that have lost a, 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 a young child or that are grieving, they would look at me and think I'm right off my rocker. But I would still say to them, I think our lives are all intertwined for a reason. And even if you lose someone, even when they're young, maybe that's their predestined life. Maybe they were only meant to be here for a short time. But it's those that are left behind that suffer. We that leave, those when we leave, we don't suffer, we're gone. It's those we leave behind. And I don't for one minute want anyone to think that I'm not, um, that I don't recognize the pain that lots of people suffer when they lose someone. But I'm just trying to to talk about that last breath. And even for a young person or an elderly person, I still in my core believe that that last breath is probably one of the most beautiful breaths of our lives. And I'll uh, until I go and find out differently, that's what I'm going. That's what I'm going to believe in. And it should be celebrated. That's right. All right. That's right. As David McGinley said in our Soul Booth conversation. Yes. It's not the length of your life or the circumstances, but, but the quality of your love. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that the quality of your love is pretty extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. And I love you to bits. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for the Soul Booth today. And I'll see you soon. Stay tuned. <laughs>